Hey and welcome to this tutorial on the pain effect. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the theory of the pain effect, how it works, and how you can model it in the finite elements simulation. Um, the, the, the pain effect was discovered by Payne a long time ago. He wrote a, a very famous paper back in 1962, and you can see the reference to it at the bottom here. And uh, that's kind of the basis for what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's interesting, if you look at this, the experimental data for uh, rubber, this is a figure from the original Payne paper. You can see that the Young's modulus on the y-axis here is the total modulus. On the x-axis, we see the strain amplitude. And um, what's typically seen for rubbers is that the strain amp uh, the, the modulus is initially constant, but then it drops very quickly as the strain amplitude increases. Um, and the green line here is about 0 0.001 strain. So that's 0.1% strain. And the, uh, the rubbers that are highly filled or have more fillers in them have a stronger and faster drop in the, in the storage modulus as the strain amplitude increases. And this is what's called the pain effect, this drop in the storage modulus with strain amplitude. And this really can be a pain because linear viscoelasticity cannot predict this kind of behavior. Uh, you can see that the pain effect is stronger for filled rubbers. And uh, it's often attributed to filler-filler interactions. So the filler particles uh, or aggregations of them are interacting and they break up as you start deforming the rubber. Um, and so this is considered like a, a damage effect, but it really manifests itself as a viscoelastic behavior. And it occurs in, in almost all rubbers, but as I mentioned, the effect is stronger in filled rubbers. And uh, what I want to talk about here is first a little bit about linear viscoelasticity and different strain uh, sweeps and, and frequency sweeps. And then we'll talk about how we can model this pain effect. What changes do we need to make? in order to actually capture this kind of behavior that we see in the experimental data in this figure. Um, so I want to start uh, by switching over to show a, a brand new M calibration window. And I will show you how you can explore these effects very quickly using M calibration. And then I will switch over to talk a little bit about um, how it works and uh, how you can model this effectively. So, so what I want to do here is I want to first create my, my virtual experiment for a DMA test. So I'm going to do a frequency sweep simulation uh, using a linear viscoelastic material model. Uh, I'm going to set that up from scratch within M calibration. So I have nothing loaded here. So I want to create data first. So this is something that uh, a lot of people are not aware that you can actually do using M calibration. I have 20 rows, five columns. They're all zero here, so I will fill that in in a second here. I'm going to set the column name, so this is going to be mean strain for my sweep. The next one is strain amplitude. Then I want to use frequency. Then I it's going to apply my storage modulus and my loss modulus. And I'm just going to leave them to be zero because I just want to simulate this. I don't have experimental data, but I want to explore how different material models behave in terms of frequency sweeps. I want a, my mean strain to be zero, but I want a strain amplitude to be half a percent strain. So I say that. Control down arrow jumps to the last cell. I take 0 0.005. Now, um, I could manually change all of these, but there is a shortcut. If you select all of the values in this uh, column by control shift upward, I can interpolate between the first and the last. So I'm going to interpolate. And they are the same. So I'll do linear interpolation. It will just add, uh, make all values the same. I'm going to do frequency sweep. I'm going to go from 0 0.01 up to 100 per, uh, in frequency. I'm going to select this whole column just like I did before by Control shift up arrow. I'm going to right click and interpolate, and I'm going to do logarithmic interpolation for the frequencies here. So then our logarithmic we interpolated between these two values, and I'm going to leave the storage and loss modulus the way they are. And then I'm going to create a load case now from this data that I just created. So clicking on this, I'm going to call this DMA frequency 
sweep. I want to change the plot style. I don't want to show the experimental data at all. Of course, we did, there is no data there. And I'm going to make this a solid prediction with uh, circles. Uh, so I save this. And here's my frequency data. Um, let me just save this file. Uh, I'm going to call it test. And let's define a material model. Um, now we can start looking at different material models. In this case, I will use an abacus hyperelastic viscoelastic material model. I will pick a Neohookian hyperelastic with five Peroni series parameters. And I select that. Now I want to make some changes here to make the, uh, the predictions look a little bit better, more interesting. I'm going to start by removing the volumetric relaxation, all the K terms I want to is deselect. It doesn't matter, but it just makes it a little easier for me to look at the graph or the table here when they're not red. I'm going to make the K value zero. Again, that doesn't matter, but it just makes it a little easier to look at the information here. Then we know that they're, they're not active. Um, and then uh, I'm going to keep C10 to be 1. I want to change this, the G values here to be very small, the first one and the last one to be very small. And I'm going to make the other ones a little bit uh, larger, 0 0.05. And I make the, the middle one 0 0.5. So it's a very high uh, uh, contribution for the middle one. I want to change now the frequencies, the tau values, so we get the peak in the middle somewhere. So I'm going to make this 100. This should be uh, 10. I go by one decade. This will make this 1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.01. So, okay, so here's my material model. I'll save this. Now I want to change my graph here so I get two things side by side. On the left side, I'm going to switch over to um, frequency in, in radians per second and uh, I want to have that on the log scale on the y-axis I'm going to do dynamic data I'm going to do storage modulus and I'll keep that and then on the right figure I'll do something similar I'm going to pick frequency radians per second I want that to be log scale the y-axis I want to be loss modulus and I save that and then I'm going to Save this. Okay, so now I set up my material model. I have a C10 of 1, as I mentioned, and uh, I will just run once and we'll see what the results look like. We'll see that here's the prediction. Uh, we got the prediction that I that I liked. We have a, a frequency sweep from 0 0.01 to 100 radians per second. And on the left side here, we have storage modulus. And we see that the uh, the storage modulus goes from a low value and increases to a high value. The high value here turns out to be given by the parameters that are in the, on the table here. We can change that. And we see the loss modulus has a peak that is exactly in the middle of this range of this one. So this is very easy to set up as I demonstrated. You can switch to different material models. You can explore this, how, how nonlinear viscoelastic versus visco, uh, linear viscoelastic or even plasticity type material models behave under cyclic loading using this approach. Um, so I have done a lot of studies uh, of this and I'm going to switch over to my presentation to show you how this uh, can look if you are going through this. So let me start the presentation again. So this is, um, this is a, a figure that shows the results from a linear viscoelastic frequency sweep, just like we did a few seconds ago uh, live. So here we have the storage modulus as a function of frequency. Uh, the parameters are listed in the table here. And we see that the max value is 6 times C10. Um, it just turns out that that's what it is in uniaxial loading. And the, the initial value is 6 times C10 times 1 minus the sum of the G values. So that's how that uh, looks under uh, frequency sweep. Uh, the loss modulus uh, has values like this. We'll see that the peak value is approximately 3 times C10 times the, the value of the Prony series term at that location. Um, and then the actual frequency where this occurs is given by the tau 3 value. 1 over tau 3 gives you this frequency in this case. 
Um, note, as I read right on the uh, right side here, that if you have experimental data for storage modulus as a function of frequency, you should be able to match that really well. Uh, but there is no guarantee that you can at the same time match the loss modulus, because the loss modulus and the storage modulus come together. From the Prony series, you get both, and you can't decouple them. So depending on what the experimental looks like, you may be able to get both storage and loss modulus, but there is no guarantee. You may only get one of them uh, and not the other one that accurately. And then you have to decide which one you want to uh, emphasize. And that's something that M-calibration, by the way, can do. You can set a weight factor for each of those. But here's the problem. This is where I started with. If you look at a linear viscoelastic material, the storage modulus does not depend on the strain amplitude. That's the definition of linear viscoelasticity. It's a superposition idea. The strain amplitude does not matter. And that's, of course, a problem. Similarly, the loss modulus is independent of the strain amplitude. Not particularly good, right? This is a, the pain that I talked about earlier. We don't see the pain effect, which is the loss in storage modulus with, with strain amplitude. So how do we fix this? What can we do to fix this? I'm going to show you one way to fix this, uh, and that's using the Bergstrom Boys model, which is the model that I developed many years ago. I talked about that in some of my other videos. And uh, it really is just a two network representation. We have a hyperelastic spring on the left, and then another hyperelastic spring on the right with a nonlinear viscoelastic dash part. With some kind of equation, and you can barely see it there, but that's, that's not really the key here. Um, the key is that this is a two-term Prony series, basically, but the Prony series have been enhanced to become nonlinear, is one way to say it. So the dash plot is a nonlinear dash plot. Um, you can make the dash plot uh, become a linear viscoelastic dash plot by setting the M parameter equal to 1 and the capital C parameter equal to 0. So this is exactly like a linear viscoelastic model, except it has additional degrees of freedom. And therefore, it will always be the same or better in its prediction. And what I will show here is that it's very interesting. By only having two terms like this, basically two prone series terms, you can capture both the frequency sweeps and amplitude sweeps. You can get the pain effect using a nonlinear viscoelastic representation. And that's kind of the, the interesting thing that I want to show here. So here's my four-parameter bergstrom boys model. It's this frequency sweep data uh, that goes from a low value to a high value, just like we see in experiments. And the loss modulus go through a peak and then a drop off, just like we see in the experiment. So this is really good. We could do this with linear viscoelasticity too, but we can do it here as well, which is good. Now, if we go strain amplitude sweep, now this is where it starts to get interesting, right? Now we can see that the storage modulus starts from a high value and then it drops off very rapidly into some lower value. And this is exactly the pain effect, obviously. And you get this for free. It comes with the BB model, the nonlinear viscoelastic setup there gives you this response, which is what you see experimentally. And that's really cool. And this is something a lot of people don't think about. And I think this is a lot of, uh, a lot of value here in, in sort of thinking about this in a little different way. And that's what I want to uh, talk about here. Um, to, to better understand how this works, if you're actually thinking about using this, I'm going to do some case studies here, um, looking at free frequency sweep data. So I'm sweeping frequency from a very low value to very high value. And then I'm looking at different values here of the mu parameter. So mu goes from 0. 8 to 1 to 1.2. So I only change the mu value. I keep all the other parameters constant. This is something M calibration can do. It's called a, a parametric study. And uh, we'll see that the curves are just shift upward with mu. And that's obvious. If you think about equations, this is really what one would expect. Uh, so that's good. The S parameter allows you to change the top value of the storage modules without changing the initial value. So it gives you the freedom to shift the curves up and down. You can shift them both up with mu, and you can sort of increase the amplitude with this S parameter. The tau base parameter shift them horizontally uh, when you look at uh, storage modulus as a function of frequency. And the M parameter changes the slope of the central region here. But remember, now this, what I'm showing here is a bergstrom boys model, which has two networks. There is nothing here that prevents you from having more than that. You can have three networks, four networks, whatever, in order to achieve a, 
a widening of the peak here because experimental data may have a very specific widening uh, response that you can't easily get with one uh, two parameter books and boys model. So you could also allow the model to have multiple networks. The last thing I want to talk about is this train amplitude sweeps uh, using this parametric approach. So here are how the, the mu parameter influence uh, the storage modulus. It shifts everything up and down as one would expect. The S parameter shifts the initial value, but not the final value. Again, this is, is if you think about this a little bit, this is what you would expect it to do as well. The tau base also shifts these curves horizontally, and the M value uh, makes the slope different. Remember now, if M is equal to one, this would be a linear viscoelastic model, which is a flat horizontal line. And that's, of course, not what we want here, but that's what that would happen. And the higher the M value, the more rapid the change is from a high to low value. And you have full control of, of that, of course, if you use this kind of nonlinear viscoelastic model. So let's summarize. The pain effect is real. It happens in almost all rubbers, um, mainly for, for highly filled rubbers and mainly for small strains. And uh, you can't predict this using linear viscoelasticity. It's just not possible. And that's a problem, of course. What I've shown here, though, is that you can predict this using a nonlinear viscoelastic material model, like the bergstrom boyce model, or a multi-network representation, like the BB model. So those are the options that I would typically recommend if that's something you're interested in doing. So in, in end, the pain effect is perfectly a keep, uh, something you can calibrate to, you can use it in your simulations, and it really isn't all that bad. Uh, but you got to do the experiments, and you need to use a proper material model in the end. So with that, I will end this little tutorial. If you have any questions, head over to polymerfm.com and ask your questions. Thank you.